Taryn, Taryn, I'll leave it in your hands. Perfect. Whenever you all are ready, I will let them in. Shall we go ahead and uh, share my screen, or do you want to wait? You can wait. Well, whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. <clears throat> All right. All right. I'll uh, let you, know, you can go on mute. Uh, you can go on mute. Okay. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Walt Catlett. I'm with the Texas Concrete Pipe Association, and we're uh, super excited that you've joined us today. Uh, for our one-hour webinar on joints and gasket fundamentals. Uh, we'll give it a moment, uh, give it, give it a, a, just another moment here. We'll let a few other people uh, trickle into the room, and then we'll kick this, uh, we'll kick this webinar off. Hopefully everyone's doing, doing well. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, individuals who are going to help with today's training. Of course, Alan is, Alan is our speaker, and I'll introduce him in a moment. And then we have Pat Buenas uh, also, who is going to be covering down on the chat box, chat room, whatever, chat. And so if you've got any questions, you know, if Alan triggers a thought, uh, by all means, uh, just go ahead and put that in the chat room, whatever your question might be, and then Pat will cover it. And if a whole bunch of you uh, overwhelm Pat, that'll be awesome. You're welcome, Pat. But if, uh, but, uh, so he may not be able to, you know, get a whole bunch in there. He may not be able to handle it. And, and so as we go along, uh, Alan does have a, have a, uh, uh, to, for Alan to uh, answer any questions that we may, may not be able to cover down on in the chat room. All right. Aaron, we are rocking and rolling. And then we also have Taryn Forrest uh, here uh, as well, who's going to help us manage uh, the workshop and any issues that anybody may have uh, with getting into Talent LMS or, or getting into the webinar. When we get done today, just, not, just so you know, you will receive a, a certificate of training. Uh, you'll get that uh, when you complete the course survey. So be thinking about that as you, uh, as you watch Alan uh, and... Uh, Cover down on the topic today. I've got uh, I've got one after one after. So, Alan, are you 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 ready to rock and roll? All right, yep, I'm gonna go ahead. Outstanding. Hey, uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar on joint and gasket fundamentals. I was super excited about y'all being here. We even more excited about our presenter, Alan Stephenthaler, who graduated from the University of Dayton in 1996 and immediately got involved in sales and marketing in the precast concrete and concrete pipe industry and has remained there ever since. Alan is the U.S. sales manager for Hamilton Kent, where he spent over 16 years working with numerous plants regarding gasket selection, water tightness testing, joint design modification, tooling, quality assurance, and more. Alan's joined by Pat Buenas, who who's been involved in the concrete pipe industry for over three decades. I thought you were younger than that, Pat. Most of which has been selling joint ceiling products. He's an independent representative uh, of Hamilton Kent. He covers central United States, including the state of Texas. Uh, so we welcome both of y'all. And with that having been said, Pat, uh, Alan, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna turn off my camera and uh, looking forward to hearing what you got to say. Okay, well, thanks, Walt, and uh, thanks for everybody for joining us for this webinar, and uh, thanks to TCPA for the opportunity. So today, I want to cover some basics about concrete pipe and structure joints, and then the gaskets that are used to seal them. Uh, we have a pretty diverse audience today with the representatives from uh, numerous concrete pipe producers, uh, municipalities, uh, consulting engineers, uh, so we've really got a broad uh, variety, a bunch of DOT folks as well. So I'm gonna do my best to cover some topics that are important to everyone. Uh, hopefully um, it's gonna be some relevance for everybody. I'll pick up a few details, uh, but there's a lot of ground to cover in the next 50 minutes. So, and I wanna leave time at the end for questions. But as Walt said, if you have anything that comes up, please go ahead and enter that into the chat room. And uh, 
Pat will try to answer those, and if not, he'll hold those to the end, and we'll answer them then. So for those on the call that don't know much about us, uh, here's just a bit about Hamilton Kent. Uh, we are a leading supplier, uh, one of the leading suppliers of rubber gaskets and flexible connectors for underground infrastructure. We have nearly 80 years of experience supplying sewer and water projects for cities, uh, DOTs, and other infrastructure owners. Uh, so Hamilton Kent employs a sizable and experienced technical department, uh, which is available to help customers, which includes uh, consulting engineers, um, DOTs, uh, pipe producers, and so on. Uh, to, with our regards to our product lines and projects where they're used. Um, and we work tirelessly to uh, develop new products as well. Uh, we do have a, a very uh, experienced sales team with several decades combined in the concrete pipe and precast industries. Uh, we manufacture a broad variety of rubber sealing products in two ISO 9001 uh, uh, certified plants, uh, one in Winchester, Tennessee, and the other in Toronto, Ontario. And, and last year, our Winchester plant became QCAS certified, and we expect Toronto to become certified in 2023. And I'll talk briefly about what that means here shortly. So here are the main topics I want to share today. Um, my hope is by the end of the session that no matter your level of experience and your role in the concrete pipe industry, uh, that you'll gain some additional knowledge when it comes to pipe joints and rubber gaskets. Here's a uh, illustration for the benefit of anyone here who might not be familiar with sewer and water conveyance systems. I expect most everybody probably is, but just in case, uh, to some extent, gaskets are used to seal connections and water distribution pipe, uh, which is shown here in dark blue. But the primary use of gaskets um, I'll be talking about today are used on pipe for sanitary and stormwater collection systems, uh, which are in light blue and brown on the screen. Uh, some cities still have combined sewer systems, which are shown here, um, that were installed decades ago, and they may even discharge sanitary water into waterways uh, during heavy rain events. However, most of these cities have taken steps to limit or eliminate these events, and I bet that many on here today have been involved in projects in this regard, uh, probably supplying pipe for new separate drainage systems, or maybe large diameter pipe or box culverts for new retainment systems, yeah, which, which then allows the city to process that combined uh, storm and sanitary water uh, once the treatment facilities are, are caught up after a big storm. Uh, so here's an illustration of a typical storm or sanitary sewer line, along with all of the different gaskets, seals, uh, connectors used to seal the system. Uh, so at the very top, you have here a watertight manhole. You have chimney seals to seal the joints between sections. Uh, down further, you have uh, manhole joints. You have casting connectors, uh, boot type connectors, repair couplings. Um, over here, you have pipe gaskets of different types, uh, saddle connectors. So all different types of rubber, rubber products that are used to seal underground infrastructure. And, and those are supplied by companies uh, like Hamilton Kent and others. So here are a few key points regarding joints and gaskets that I'll be covering the, during the session. So first is the pipe produce, it's the pipe producer's responsibility to ensure that both the joint and the gasket meet the specifications on a project. Second, the field performance of a joint relies upon these critical factors. So number one, the joint design and how well that joint is produced, uh, which means not only the surface quality of the joint, but also the dimensional tolerances. Second would be the selection and the quality of the rubber gasket supplied on the project. And finally, the care with which both the gasket and the pipe are installed. So we'll talk more about all of that here shortly. So now let's get into concrete pipe and manhole joints. So I want to touch quickly on each of the three that are most popular in our industry. And they're listed here along with the other names that are sometimes referred to as. Okay, so first the tongue and groove joint, um, also known as a mortar joint. Uh, this joint is the easiest to produce as it offers the greatest dimensional tolerance. Installation should be relatively simple as contractors usually utilize butyl sealant, uh, which is not difficult, uh, can be messy uh, depending on the conditions, and can present some challenges to keep the butyl in place on, the, on some horizontal joints like a box culvert. Uh, gaskets can sometimes be used on these joints, but only if the slope on the joint is five degrees or less. And the reason for that is, is that because when a joint is not honed completely, 
um, the gap between the bell and spigot will be greater the more slope you have on the joint. So if you have a slope that's what I'll show you here in a minute of 10 or 12 or 15 degrees, then it's going to open up really quickly and that gasket won't seal. Um, for uh, contractors relying on butyl only, there's, there's not much flexibility offered to withstand settling or load changes. Uh, so these joints are sometimes also wrapped externally to provide additional protection against water and or silt leakage through the joint. So here's a box section with a tongue and groove joint. Uh, this is by far the most common joint found on precast box sections throughout North America. Uh, you can see that the corners are nice and sharp. Um, there are no voids or bug holes on the surface and the lines are very straight. So this, while this is an example of a high quality joint, it is not designed to utilize a gasket because of the slope on the joint. It's just too great of a slope, uh, which appears to be 10 degrees or more. So, but this is very common and that's why a lot of joints like this cannot use a gasket. Uh, tongue groove joints can be sealed with mortar, uh, a practice we see mostly in Western states. Uh, we support a shift away from this uh, towards the use of gaskets uh, because mortar really has no flexibility. Uh, therefore, any movement of a pipe is likely to open up that joint to leakage. Uh, this can happen during the backfilling, uh, the, com the compaction of the trench. It can happen later on when heavy equipment is moving over it, or even after the project is complete when subjected to seismic act activity. Um, rubber gaskets can easily handle any of these conditions uh, without compromising the seal. And that's why we support uh, a move towards a gasket away from mortar joint. Uh, confined O-ring uh, joint. Uh, this is the primary gasket of joint that was produced up through the 80s. Uh, it was developed to provide superior water tightness with the gasket highly compressed inside the, the confined groove, which you can see right here. Some plants uh, still, still use this joint today for projects requiring resistance to higher external water pressure. Uh, depending on the joint dimensions, it might be possible to use a wedge-shaped gasket on a joint like this. Uh, we have supplied a number of jacking and microtunnel pipe projects with one of our profile gaskets for confined groove with excellent results. <clears throat> there are some challenges that, um, with, with this joint though. It is more difficult and labor intensive to manufacture because of the snap ring that forms this confined groove. Um, stripping that band from the finished product can easily damage the corners along the joint requiring repairs. And there are also challenges during installation at the job site as there are many gasket installation steps, which I'll show, show those later. Additionally, uh, the homing force required to bring pipe together is, is pretty high as the gasket must deform within that groove enough to allow the bell to slide over the spigot. Uh, so there's just, there are many things that must be done precisely and have joints and gaskets produced to such tight tolerances. So there is really not much room for error. That's the reason it's, it's a challenging joint. We're gonna talk about joint quality and gasket installation briefly in a few minutes, but I just wanted to share with you what I mean by challenges in production around the confined groove. So this is definitely a rough joint on the left. Uh, didn't get good consolidation, may have had some, some leakage around that, around that joint area um, of the paste, the cement paste. Um, but did, you know, first it didn't get uh, good consolidation, but second of all, didn't get good repair before it went to the job site. And this, this was a piece of pipe at the job site I went to. But on the right side, you have an O-ring gasket within the groove, or an O-ring um, yeah, gasket within the groove of the joint. And this looks like a really nice joint. It's, it's well produced and, and well prepared. And that's what you want to see. And finally, the single offset joint, by far the most popular gasket joint in our industry today. Generally speaking, the manufacturing of this joint is easier than an O-ring joint, but there are still tight joint tolerances that must be met in order to accommodate the gasket and good production practices that must be followed to achieve um, joints ready for a gasket. Uh, gasket installation is greatly simplified as there are fewer steps for the contractor at the job site. And generally speaking, homing of the pipe or manhole section in the field requires less force, which is something the contractors enjoy. There is still a very good pressure resistance, um, easily reaching 13 PSI with a high quality joint and with the correct and properly installed gasket. There are a number of gasket styles and configurations available for this joint, uh, and we'll talk about those um, shortly and how you select those. And for those of you who don't already know uh, some of the joint terminology, the difference between the annular space and the total annular space, those are two terminology or pieces of terminology that are used a lot. The bigger space right here is the, is the total annular space, also referred to as TAS, 
And then the smaller space above the step is the annular space, AS. Um, so those are some terms you might want to know, but uh, the gasket will sit right up against the step, and we'll show that in a few minutes too. And here are a couple of different gaskets sitting on the step of the, of the single offset joint. So on the left, you have a pre-lubricated super seal gasket on a piece of pipe. And then on the right, you have a profile gasket or a wedge-shaped gasket on a precast manhole. Uh, gaskets work well on single offset joints for arch pipe and elliptical pipe as well. Um, and these are both show um, pre-lubricated gaskets um, on those, those. Those work really well because they do help you're holding the pipe to, to center the, the joint uh, within the belt or the pipe within uh, the bell of the previously laid section. So it's, uh, it's a, that's a, a nice benefit. And then as well as on square pipe, or more commonly referred to as box culverts. Uh, but anyway, back, uh, gasket boxes uh, have been become more popular in some municipalities and states uh, as they found it to be a good alternative to cast in place culverts, uh, mostly because of a shortage of labor. Um, but both images show the rounded corners required to utilize a traditional single offset gasket, like the pre-lubricated super seal that are shown in these joints. Okay, so why gasket of joints? Um, for some manufacturing plants, uh, consulting engineers, agencies, there may not be any question that pipe is installed with gaskets. Um, but there are still many markets where, where butyl sealant or mortar are still used on manholes and or concrete pipe. So point number one, uh, we're seeing more and more engineers requiring gasket joints versus butyl sealant um, after seeing how well they perform in other states. For example, we're now seeing uh, gasket stormwater pipe and or manholes being required in North Carolina, Kansas, and Oklahoma, a change that's just happened in the last couple of years. And we expect that to continue to grow. Uh, if you look at looking at a, a country like Canada, I mean, uh, everything is gasketed. Uh, like storm, uh, sanitary sewer, everything is gasketed. Uh, so I kind of feel like the U.S. is kind of moving that direction. Gasket joints are relatively easy to install and perform uh, very well, uh, consistently better than butyl sealant, and definitely far superior to mortar, as we've mentioned. Uh, gasket pressure ratings are oftentimes higher, and, and being flexible, they can rebound to maintain water tightness in the joint if there's any differential loading that causes the joint to deflect or shift. Uh, butyl sealant has very limited ability to maintain a seal if, there any, if there's any joint movement, uh, which can happen in construction, um, or if the joints not they're not home very well, uh, it's that sometimes that external water pressure can actually blow a butyl sealant out of the joint if it's not home all the way. Uh, gaskets are cleaner to install, especially the pre-lubricated style, um, and are also helpful at job at the job site if the contractor needs to remove a section and reinstall it. Um, you, a lot of times, the gasket will stay on the joint, and you just have to pull it apart and put it back together with butyl sealant. Uh, if there's a mistake in, in holding it, um, and it's really difficult to pull the sections back apart. And finally, gasket joints allow for immediate backfill, uh, where a mortar joint requires extra time to set properly. So what if underground infrastructure fails? So here's just an example in this picture. Uh, you can see the pavement, uh, which is cracked around the manhole frame, and it's actually sinking due to infiltration into the drainage system and erosion of the fine materials under the pavement. So usually this happens because there's either a leak within the manhole joints or within the connection between the pipe and the manhole. Uh, this is one reason why cities are becoming more critical. They would prefer to pay a little extra for a job done correctly to avoid costly repairs to a location like this within a few years after they've taken ownership of, of a street or a road. So these are the types of headlines that are seen way too often, uh, especially now with the, the type of storms we've been having. And usually they're, they're re the result of either improper pipe selection, installation or maintenance, or a powerful storm event, uh, which a system is really never designed to handle. Uh, it's some some uh, systems are designed to be to handle 50 year or 100 year uh, storms, and we've been having those more and more frequently. So there's really not uh, designed in a lot of cases to handle those. So these are all good reasons for cities and other consulting engineers to ensure they're specifying receiving watertight systems. So you might remember this major infrastructure failure in the parking lot of an IHOP in Meridian, Mississippi, a few years ago. Uh, the corrugated steel structure failed, and I'm not really sure that anybody figured out exactly what happened, but the popular theory and, and what I believe happened is that there probably was a, a sizable leak within the, the, one of the joints or within the pipe, 
and it allowed a significant amount of the fill around the pipe to flow into the pipe, leaving a significant void under the parking lot. And so then when cars parked on it, uh, the remaining soil couldn't bear the weight, so it just collapsed. So they're really not pointing any, any fingers here. Just wanted to share what cities, developers, and engineers, what, what they're wanting to avoid, because uh, this was definitely a costly repair for, I'm not sure it was IHOP, if it was the city, but somebody had a costly repair here. So <clears throat> moving on to gas selection, while uh, this may seem straightforward, there are many considerations to ensure the right gas is selected for a particular application, including meeting industry standards and creating a water tight seal. So pictured here are the cross sections of a few different styles of, of gaskets, some of which you may recognize, so, but they can all be useful depending on the application and requirements. So first one you have up here in the top left is a super seal pre-lubricated gasket. Uh, the red is, is inside the, the rolling tube, that's a silicone uh, lubricant. Uh, you also have an O-ring uh, gasket for the um, confined groove joint. Here's a profile gasket that can be used in a confined groove. You have a variety of different profile gaskets, uh, some that are meant for deeper burials with higher external water pressure. And even down here in the bottom right, you have one that's meant for gluing onto a, uh, a mortar joint or a tongue and groove joint if it's uh, five degrees or less of slope. So quite a, quite a variety of different uh, types of gaskets. So what are some of the factors that affect the selection of the gaskets? Um, the first is, is obviously going to be the type of joint form equipment being used by the manufacturing plant. So this will narrow the selection of gaskets immediately, as gaskets typically have a specific joint design for which they can be used. Um, borrowing equipment from another manufacturing location may require consulting with your gasket supplier to ensure that you're getting what you need. In the case of completely new joint designs, we frequently work with um, plants to ensure that the best possible joint design is selected when considering gasket uh, pricing as well as performance. Another consideration is what the contractors or cities in your market are expecting. So getting a new type of seal or gasket accepted by an engineer or municipality can be very easy. It could be very time consuming or could be anywhere in between that. And the same goes with the contractor. Uh, in both cases, you obviously need a compelling reason from their perspective as to why they should consider a change. Um, but we've, we've worked with many customers um, over the years to transition from butyl sealant to a gasket, uh, from a profile gasket to a pre lube gasket. Uh, and by doing so, we you know, provide training for the team as well as, as their customers being the contractor. Um, related to municipal expecta expectations, uh, the gasket type may be dictated by state or local specifications, uh, but could also be selected to meet the special project requirements. For instance, uh, we offer a couple gaskets that perform better under higher external water pressure. So it perform better for deep burials that are in a high water table, for instance. The next consideration is what gasket characteristics are most important for you or for your, your company? I mean, is it going to be sealing capability, um, ease of installation, reliability, price, um, maybe it's availability. Uh, but finally, the, uh, the rubber material can impact the type of gasket used as well. In some, in some instances, you may have a gasket profile that can only be made with a certain type of material. So now let's take a moment to discuss ASTM requirements for gaskets. Uh, the most common pipe and, and structure industry requirements uh, refer to one specification for the physical properties of rubber gaskets, and that's ASTM C1619. So while you still see, and you're, and you're going to continue to see um, projects that and, and specs that have ASTM C361, C443, 1628, 1677, uh, you're still going to see those, but you need to be familiar with the corresponding C1619. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, then you can also uh, talk to your gasket supplier about it. Uh, but the big, biggest differences you'll notice are on the tensile strength. So if you look on the first row here, class A, which is your C361 um, gasket, is 2300 on its tensile strength. Class C, which is C443, is, is much lower. And then class E, which is going to be your 1628, is kind of in between. And then the other big difference is coming down here to the second to last row, which shows um, basically exposure to oils and what that does to the gasket um, as far as volume increase. And class B would be your C361 oil resistant gasket. And then class D would be your um, C443 oil resistant gasket. 
So just get familiarity with that chart is, is helpful when it comes to uh, looking at projects. So regarding gasket material selection, in some cases, what a, paint, a pipe plant orders will be dictated by the specifications on a project. So stormwater drainage projects usually reference C443. So the rubber material selected by your gasket supplier will meet that specification by meeting C1619 class C. However, uh, you may be required to utilize gaskets made of specialty rubber materials like poly polyisoprene, uh, which is generally used for C361 projects, um, which is gonna be what's typical for sanitary projects. So pipe manufacturers need to pay close attention to the jobs that they're bidding to make sure that they're getting the correct gaskets for those because you, you can't use a C443 project, or sorry, C443 gasket on a C361 project. Uh, EPDM rubber has excellent ozone and UV resistance. So these gaskets are typically used uh, when the rubber is going to be unprotected outdoor for an extended period of time. So for instance, if a gasket's going to be uh, glued onto a box culvert or a pipe uh, for an extended period of time before it's installed, uh, that's, a, that's a great opportunity for using EPDM, uh, as well as if it's going to be exposed to acidic or high alkali conditions. Um, a lot of, uh, of pipe to manhole connectors, uh, they're going to be made out of EPDM for the same reason uh, as the glued on gaskets to give you that ozone and UV resistance. Uh, some projects require um, oil resistant gaskets, which are usually made from nitrile or neoprene rubber. Uh, these could include projects like airports, um, parking structures, uh, any place where um, the gaskets could be exposed to um, de-icing chemicals, oils, fuels, things like that. But we're starting to see um, nitrile and neoprene gaskets being um, specified on projects um, on lines that are running through uh, contaminated soils uh, with you know, less and less uh, good areas to develop. Um, now there's you know, uh, developers are starting to use um, uh, utilize lands that are, may have some contamination. And so they need these oil resistant gaskets for those. Um, but it's really important for the pipe producer um, when they're bidding jobs, uh, when they're supplying jobs, to pay attention to those requirements. Uh, because those these types of gaskets do cost a lot more, and they usually take longer to deliver from a gasket supplier. Uh, so those could have issues with uh, put your pricing on the job, but also the delivery times. And one thing to note also is that there will be physical differences between gaskets made of different materials, especially uh, neoprene and nitrile. Uh, these gaskets that feel harder, uh, more rigid, more challenging to stretch onto the spigot of a pipe, and, and the holding force to put the pipe together is going to be more. Uh, gaskets um, may be marked uh, for different colors uh, or in different colors uh, to designate what type of material it is, uh, but they're always going to have printing on them just to give you some basic information, such as who the manufacturer is, the gasket profile type, uh, the pipe or manhole size, ASTM standards they need. Uh, usually it's going to have a manufacturing date, maybe uh, should have a batch number or a job number, but that's all information that you want to see on that, on the gasket, so that there's, it's easy for um, the producer of the, the gasket, as well as the pipe producer, to identify uh, what it is. Uh, so the next step in the process of selecting a gasket um, is going to be uh, basically working with the engineering team of the gasket supplier. So they're gonna review the project and or um, pipe plant requirements, as well as look at the joint details for important dimensions. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, they'll then determine which gasket or gaskets we supply um, that will meet the requirements found during this evaluation. And finally, they'll calculate the correct amount of stretch for the selected gaskets to determine the cut length of the gasket or gaskets. So obviously we wanna supply gaskets that have sufficient rubber in the joint to provide a high ceiling force, um, but we also want to make sure that they can be installed on the spigot with a reasonable amount of effort and make sure they're not too loose on the joint so that when you're holding pipe that it doesn't come loose during that holding process. So a lot of different uh, factors you have to keep in mind when you're um, selecting and designing a gasket. So here's the typical joint design uh, for a 42 inch concrete pipe. So I've, I've circled some of the key dimensions that you can see up here. So this is going to be the Inside diameter of the bell, uh, you have the, the, the length of the spigot from the end of the spigot to the, to the step. You have the annular space, 0.446. You have the slope of the, of the um, joint, which is two degrees. Uh, right here, you have the annular space of 0.146. Uh, 
And uh, then you have an inside or outside diameter of the, the spigot at the step, right below the step. So those are all just, uh, different uh, dimensions that it, the engineers are going to consider when they're uh, picking out the gasket. Uh, one thing I did want to note is that that 0.146 is significant because it does allow for space for the rolling tube and the pre loop gasket. So as I just mentioned there about that space, so I wanted to demonstrate what this means. So an image, of, um, this is an image of one of our demonstration tools, and you can see that over here on this side, you have the bell of the pipe, and over here you have the spigot, and you have the gasket sitting on the, the um, right in front of the step there on the spigot. So as that bell is coming over, you can see it's just started to catch that rolling tube and, and move into that annular space. So now this, this is the video that's in action showing that same demonstration tool, and you can see that the um, as the bell comes over, it's going to pick up that rolling tube and slide it into the annular space. So that's kind of it's the reason I pointed out about the, the spacing and the joint there is to make sure there's room for that rolling tube. The rolling tube actually has a lot of benefits. I and mean, as I mentioned before, about self-centering the pipe within the, the bell. Um, also, it provides some cushion between the bell and the spigot, which is, is helpful um, in a number of different ways, but it also helps to lock together the pipe. So you're not going to have as much kickback um, after holding pipe. Okay, so let's shift into quality assurance. So <clears throat> this is a good time to talk about the American Concrete Pipe Association or ACPA's QTAS program. Um, this is a voluntary quality assurance certification program that they designed uh, many years ago. Uh, ACPA maintains a detailed quality control manual that's used by the precast and pipe plants in their, in their programs and by the third party inspection agency, uh, which is West Janney Elsner, which evaluates and grades plants on adherence to the manual. Um, <clears throat> pardon me for a second. I just wanted to meet myself so I could clear my throat, but I can't seem to figure out how to do it. Anyway, the QCAS manual is uh, regularly reviewed and, and updated um, by the association and its members. And in fact, a, a new manual is taking effect on January 2nd. So for anybody who works at a, at a pipe plant, um, just make sure that your team is aware of the updates to the manual that's coming out uh, that takes effect here next year. Um, QCAS has clear requirements when it comes to joint forming equipment quality assurance. Um, so even if a pipe plant um, is not part of this program. Uh, we still think it's a great benefit uh, to them to use this practice of, of checking their equipment. And so this, this manual is available for download on the ACPA main, or on ACPA website. So last year, ACPA added certification for gasket producers, allowing companies like Hamilton Kent to become certified. Uh, companies certified under this new category where we must conduct gasket testing as already outlined in the QCAS manual, and then as well as host an annual inspection by WJE to ensure that they're following, or we are following uh, the proper gasket testing procedures. So just like uh, concrete pipe plants are getting inspected, uh, we have to get inspected uh, as well. Uh, so certified gasket suppliers um, then are, are able to provide the documentation on the testing that they're doing to their customers. And then they're able to meet the customers and able to maintain the paperwork for their own inspection when, when WJE comes in. So no further gasket testing is required by the pipe producer. Uh, so it's a really a big time saving benefit for them. Uh, gasket quality insurance. Why is gasket quality insurance important? And so here are the top reasons that I've identified. So from a performance standpoint, there's really a pretty slim margin between having a watertight joint and a problem in the field. Uh, gaskets are meant to provide a firm fit between the, the spigot and the bell. But if there's if there's too little rubber in the gaskets, then there's a potential um, for leakage. If there's too much rubber in, in, in the joint or in the gasket, you know, it's going to cause them some issues with homing and potentially uh, uh, breaking bells at the job site. So by regularly checking the dimensions and properties of your gaskets, or just ensuring the gaskets received from a QCAS certified gasket manufacturer that they meet what was ordered. Uh, you're helping to prevent this type of problem. Uh, obviously, by ensuring the correct gaskets are in your inventory and that they meet the physical requirements, the contractor should receive the correct gaskets 
but obviously whoever's pulling those gaskets uh, from your shelves uh, for shipments, they'll have to ensure that they match the pipe size. Uh, one important service um, pipe producers can provide contractors is, is just training and instructions on proper gasket installation. And this is something you could also partner with your gasket supplier. Uh, this is especially important if you're planning to switch in between completely different gasket types, like from a profile to a pre-lubricated, or if you're just for the first time going to be introducing a gasket in your market. Um, unfortunately, uh, what we found is a lot of times it's the newest guy on a contractor's crew that's installing the gaskets. So sometimes a quick demonstration on how to put the gasket on uh, will, will you know, basically you know, really prevent a lot of issues. Uh, but all these points really boil down to two important results, and, and that is that the gasket performs properly with the joint and that the pipe supplier saves money and headaches by reducing or eliminating these complaints and service calls. So uh, ultimately, that's the comfort level you want to have with your gaskets. So I mentioned QCAS already. So what is required of certified plants? So first of all, all relevant joint drawings must be kept on file. Um, and from our perspective, some plants do a fantastic job of this, um, but others um, maybe who tend to buy used equipment or receive equipment from a sister plant, oftentimes they don't have this paperwork. So if you're a plant that's, that's getting used equipment, uh, it's, you know, it's really important to try to get the joint drawings um, so that, that to match up with that equipment. Um, QCAS requires it, but your gasket supplier really appreciates it as well. So if, if we can't get a, a joint detail, um, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll do some uh, detailed measuring of, of, jo of joints or, or of um, equipment, and we'll recreate a joint design and then and select a gasket from there. Uh, plants must also ensure that the correct gaskets are being used for the correct application. And kind of like we've talked about before with C443 and C361 differences, as well as the materials. Uh, next, certified plants not buying from a certified supplier must measure the physical properties of the sampling of their gaskets. So as I also talked about there, we've already mentioned, uh, and we're going to talk about here in a second also, um, plants also must maintain in-house reports verifying the dimensions of the gaskets and be able to demonstrate uh, the knowledge of how to measure the gasket. So for QCAS certified plants not buying from a, a QCAS certified gasket company, here are the, the checks that you have to do or your quality of personnel have to do to conduct those tests. So first of all, the strength of the splice on the gasket, and this is, this is really a critical one. And this is the area where the rubber strip has been spliced to form a round gasket using a splicing tape or glue. So if a gasket is going to fail physically, it will most likely occur in the splice. So this video is demonstrating such a test. They've locked it into a, a piece of equipment that they've designed for stretching, and then they'll, they'll spread it apart. And while they're, he's doing that, I'm going to talk about the other checks. So the gasket volume needs to be checked for solid body gaskets. For O-ring gaskets, you must check the core diameter. The cut length for all gaskets must be verified. The hardness of the rubber or the durometer must be confirmed. And for pre-lubricated and profile gaskets, the height and width of the gaskets must be measured. So now you see in this video that he's actually checking the splice to make sure that it's that it's uh, there aren't any tears or any separations in that splice. So now we're going to talk uh, a little bit about joint quality. So in the rare case of a joint leak, uh, it is most likely to occur due to improper installation, but it could also be a problem with the joint. That's, that's potential, such as broken or cracked bells or spigots, or maybe if there's a large void in the surface of the joint uh, where the gasket would seal. Um, there, there are definitely some quality assured steps that pipe plants can take to, and, and many of them already are, to prevent questionable pipe from making it to a job site. So that really cuts us down on any issues in the field. Uh, rubber gasket joints are, as I've mentioned before, almost unanimously, unanimously accepted as, as the best sealing, um, sealing product for, for pipe joints. Um, contractors uh, certainly want to make money on their projects, so they're looking for lower prices, but they also want, to per want performance in the field. So they can't afford to have issues that cost them time and money for repairs or penalties. So like in this picture here of a poorly installed pipe joint, uh, this, this picture was taken using a robotic camera running through the, the stormwater, um, stormwater pipe. Um, this, and this is a practice that has been, you know, is becoming much more prevalent. A lot more municipalities are using this as a way to check the, the, uh, like the installation and the quality of a pipeline. Um, and, and cities and engineers are becoming much more careful about, you know, the 
that's the reason they're using these uh, robotic uh, robotic cameras. They just want to make sure they're going to be getting a good quality uh, stormwater or sanitary pipeline and to avoid future problems and expenses. Uh, final thing I want to note is that competitive material pipe suppliers are pushing harder and harder for market share. So it's vitally important for our industry to provide good joints and maintain the excellent reputation of this industry. Okay, so let's talk about joint plumbing equipment. So the headers, pallets, and other plumbing equipment um, that are used to make pipe joints represent a great deal of investment for concrete pipe producers, especially based on the replacement cost today and not, not to mention the lead times for the new equipment. Uh, so for this reason, I think it's, it's really important that the plant personnel handling the equipment understand this. I, mean, I would hope a greater understanding and appreciation of the replacement costs and, and the time uh, will make a, make them be more careful. I mean, maybe maybe I'm, it's wishful thinking, but I would hope they'd be more careful knowing that how much it costs. So good joints start with the tooling. And when you start with good equipment, everything that is formed on it is more likely to be of higher quality and within the, the dimensional tolerances that are needed to use, uh, use a gasket in the field. The ideal dimensions and tolerances, uh, which will be compared to the actual measurements on your equipment, can be provided by your tooling manufacturer. Um, but ultimately, we prefer to, to supply those because we know what dimensional tolerances are best for our gaskets. So I, I would suggest that uh, if you're going to be measuring equipment, to reach out to your gasket supplier as well to get those dimensions. So for tooling quality assurance, let's first go over some general requirements of QCAST. Um, but, but there also would be good practices for non-certified plants. So anytime a plant receives new tooling, and this includes everything listed here, you're required to perform an inspection on this equipment, which is, is not only a visual inspection to make sure there's not any physical, physical damage, a cracking or gouging or anything like that that's on the surface, uh, but really so you want to make sure that the, the measurements of, the, of every piece is going to be within the specified dimensional tolerances. So uh, inspection records should be maintained for the life of these. So when you measure that equipment, you've got to maintain the records of that measuring. Um, and I think, and really it's, it's, it's such an incredibly important step just considering the investment to buy, to buy new equipment. So you, know, you want to make sure that, uh, that your equipment is in tolerance. And I mentioned that because this in particular picture was at a new pipe plant a few years ago. I measured all the equipment there. And we found, I mean, most of it was, was perfect. It was great. But we did find six, um, six 24 inch pallets that for whatever reason were out of tolerance, they're all together. So something either happened during shipping or manufacturing of those pallets. Um, but it was, it was good for them to, uh, for the, the pipe plant to identify those, make sure that they weren't used in production so that their joints were gonna be in tolerance. Um, so for QCAS sanitary certification, plants must also conduct an annual inspection of tooling utilized in production and maintain records of those inspections. But even if you're not a certified plant, uh, you need to conduct equipment inspections on some kind of regular basis, especially tongue formers, uh, which are subjected to a great deal of friction and wear because they are forming every spigot for a particular size. So I, I've measured equipment at numerous plants, and it's almost always, if there's equipment that's out of tolerance, it's going to be the tongue formers uh, because they just, they just get so much wear and tear on them. Uh, but make sure you have a plan. Um, if you do find equipment that's out of tolerance, what you're going to do with that. Um, if it's damaged or likewise, you know, whether it's going to be re repaired or replaced. Um, if you're going to repair it, just make sure that that equipment is measured again before put back, putting it back into production. Uh, just you want to make sure you don't have any joint dimensional issues uh, on, uh, when you're using repaired equipment. So the location on, on the equipment uh, where you're measuring, uh, this is going to be performed on the slope surface, which forms the gasket ceiling surface for single offset joints. Uh, measuring of confined groove joints will be able to have a, a little bit different checkpoints, uh, and you can get that from your gasket supplier. Uh, more or less, you want to measure the, the dimensions on the sloped surface that's right here, so on the tooling. So right here, you would have uh, what would be the inside of the header, uh, so going measuring an inch and a half down on the header, so you measure that dimension. And then the corresponding measurement on the pallet, an inch and a half down on that as well. So that's roughly where the gasket would be sitting in the joint. And that's where you want to check to make sure the dimensions are good. Um, gasket and pipe and manholes manufactured from tooling falling outside of these tolerances, they run the risk of either not holding it properly because the joint is too tight 
or pa not passing water tightness because the joint is too big. Uh, one thing I want to point out, um, there is a common mistake and assumption that we hear, I've heard it numerous times, and that is that if the pallet is wearing and the header is wearing, then really it's going to work out fine because they're, 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 you know, they're both wearing in the same direction. But in reality, they don't wear that direction. So if you have a pallet that's wearing, you're going to have bells that are tighter. Uh, they're going to be smaller on the inside diameter. And if you have headers that are wearing, you have spigots that are going to be a little bigger. So in reality, as both pieces of equipment um, that they wear, that joint gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So you know, we, sometimes we have customers that ask us, hey, can you make a smaller gasket for my joints because my equipment's worn? And while that, that in practice will work, it's really not the best way to do it. What you really need to do is, is make an investment on in new equipment and make sure that your joints are staying in tolerance. So this video showed measurement of a pallet at one of our customers' new plants earlier this year. Um, so there, um, Marcus is uh, using the HK measuring tool. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of video or um, uh, uh, detail about the video, but you can see he, he measured in two different directions, uh, which is appropriate for a, a, a piece that's this size, you know, 12 or 15 inch, something like that. You only know, measure in one dimension and then the other, and go 90 degrees and measure again. But larger equipment, you want to measure in the appropriate number of, of measurements that would be basically moving the tool 12 to 15 inches around the piece. So you may do only uh, two, two directions on 12s, 15s, 18s. But when you get up to like 24s, you may go to three. And then when you get up to larger sizes, you may do as many as five or six measurements. So just you know, what, whatever's appropriate for that size. But this is the type of thing we're talking about measuring equipment that I'm referring to. Um, keeping your tooling equipment in good shape can be achieved by developing a few good habits, such as having it visually inspected frequently. Uh, I've been a few plants to measure equipment and have and found significant damage to pallets or headers. And they really have gone unnoticed because the plant is, you know, they're just, they're just running through the equipment, they're, they're producing pipe, they're producing pipe, and they're really not taking the time to look at it. But when they unstack it all and to lay it out to measure it, that's when things become really obvious. Uh, Cleaning residual concrete off of the equipment and keeping it free of corrosion is very important. Uh, storing the tooling as defined by your tooling supplier, uh, which in our opinion means you don't store it like it is on that picture there on the bottom, uh, where the, it's standing on end like that. Um, over time, you know, any type of, of metal can warp, especially if it's a larger piece, because there's so much weight to it that it will want to warp. So really don't recommend storing it like that. Uh, as you would expect, some equipment materials are, are more susceptible but, um, uh, to, to warping, but it's important that they're all handled correctly. So even a short drop of, of equipment to a concrete floor can cause damage. So you can see in that, this picture here that there's a big chunk that's broken off the top of the pallet. So that's, that's the type of thing you want to avoid. Um, and that's why you know, keeping your, your crew knowledgeable on how important it is to handle correctly, uh, how important it is. So here's some examples of, of joint forming equipment that what it really should not look like. Uh, the image on the left shows significant buildup here. And, and same over on the right, you've got a lot of, of concrete debris. And that was that was all, I actually tried to just put a scraper on it to see what happened. And that's all, that's all solid concrete. So these are two pieces of equipment that definitely would need to be, uh, need a lot of attention before they're put back into production. Uh, this pallet was, was likely dropped. You can see down here in the bottom side, maybe a little bit hard to see in the picture, but I hope not. But that's a flattened section of the inside of that pallet. Um, fortunately, the producer had pulled that aside and taken it out of production because they found that. But, but sometimes I wonder, you know, how often does something like this go unnoticed, either unnoticed or unreported? Uh, I, I would hope that um, plenty of plants would think it's important that their, their crews understand why, you know, what, what this equipment is doing, it's forming a joint and why that's important to have a good joint, which means good equipment. And so that anything, anything does happen, gets cracked or gets broken like this, uh, that, that it's recorded so they can pull it out of uh, production. Um, if equipment's gonna be stored outside, um, be sure you have your supplier, equipment supplier provide recommendations on best practices. Uh, sometimes they'll re recommend a coating to put on it to keep from rust from building up. Uh, but really, this, I mean, this doesn't, it is not as a big problem. It's just, we would uh, you know, suggest that it should be cleaned before being put back into, into production, just at least a, a good scraping. 
Um, when it comes to equipment maintenance, uh, I just wanted to share a, a quick example with you. So there was a precast plant um, that had been complaining about a lot of problems that they were experiencing in the field with you know, joints not holding properly, um, bells getting broken. It was all leading to an excessive amount of service calls. And so they had asked us, um, because they suspected there was a problem with their equipment, so they asked us to come in and measure. So one of our engineers and I went in there and measured 100% of their, their equipment and found that a, a lot of what they were using on a daily basis was out of tolerance. And so they took that out of production, um, swapped in equipment that was, that was better, or it was intolerance, and virtually eliminated all of those issues out in the field. So it really cut down a lot of costs, a lot of headaches, um, improved their reputation as a, as a, as a quality uh, supplier. Uh, so it's really good for everybody in that instance. Um, it's certainly possible to, uh, to measure the spigots and bells of concrete pipe with a measuring tool, like the one we were measuring, showing you earlier with measuring equipment. So these guys over here on the right are actually using one of our tools to measure. It's not the ideal way to do it because concrete is a little rougher than, than measuring pallets and headers. Um, so it's maybe a little more difficult to, to get a good measurement, but eventually you can get that. But what we think is more feasible is using a go no go gauge. And I've got two of them pictured there, um, one on the left and one here in the middle. And, and those are really, uh, really good for doing a, a quick, um, easy dimensional check of the of finished pipe um, that would be used on gasket projects. It's just a, a great way to make sure it's intolerance. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, on, on post-production quality assurance, but I did want to um, just stress the importance of this for you know, post, both for post-production and pre-shipping. So I just mentioned the go-no-go -go gauges. That's a great way to do an inspection um, of the dimensions, but a visual inspection is, is important as well. As you can see in this picture right here, there's, there's some major voids and, and you know, like a big, big void and bug holes on this, on this joint. Could cause a problem with the gasket, I'd say. Um, so these are the types of things that you should not see in the field. Those, those should be dressed up before they're shipped out uh, because that will make sure that the gasket will seal with that joint. Um, hopefully see less, uh, less job site issues, repairs, claims, and that kind of thing. Okay, so just to so spend a last a little bit here talking about um, uh, gaskets to the job site. So we do have a few recommendations. Uh, first of all, um, it's it's um, good installation techniques must be followed by the contractor. Um, in the case of offering a new gasket, which we discussed, um, just making sure, or, or an inexperienced crew for that matter, uh, just making sure that you take the initiative to ensure contractors are using proper methods. And if there's going to be you know, DOT or a municipal inspector, making sure that they understand uh, what the proper practices should be so they can kind of keep an eye on those projects as they're being installed. Um, so this can be done by in-person training or supplying documentation, or even, even better is to supply a link to a video uh, so they can actually look at it on their phone or a laptop or something. Um, but make, make sure that they understand the proper installation techniques of both the gasket and the pipe. Uh, for overing and profile gaskets, um, it does include equalization and lubing, which I'll show here in just a minute. Uh, three lube gaskets, um, those do not require um, either of those, but some, some installers have found that that doing a little equalization of a pre-loop gasket does help on larger sizes. A contractor's operating in cold environments, and, and yes, I know Texas usually is not cold, but I think it is now, or it will be this week, that's for sure. Um, but in, in cases where there's uh, it's cold weather, the gaskets will feel a lot harder, um, and it will require a, a lot more um, uh, effort to put up, put the gasket on the spigot, and, and the holding forces will be higher. So. My recommendation is just if it's going to be really cold out, um, throw the gaskets in the, you know, the, the cab of the pickup truck or in a job trailer or something, make sure they're warmed up before they're installed and you should be good to go. So just a, uh, a this is a short video of showing the uh, pre-lubricated -lubric, pre gasket, how it's installed. So it's just going to brush the dirt off it, which is a you know, good practice for any gasket. And he's going to stretch it over the top of the spigot, and then down along the bottom, make sure it's, it's up against the step, and then that's it. So, so really, really simple. Um, for a profile gasket, the insulation is a little bit more involved. So first, you stretch the gasket over the spigot. Then 
you're going to push the gasket up against the step. And then you're going to run a screwdriver under the gasket a couple of times to equalize the tension on it and, and the height of the gasket all the way around. Then put, put lube across the face of the gasket only, and then lube the bell really well. And one thing I want to notice or note is that um, I, it is, this video is really quick, but just when he was putting the, the uh, um, putting the lube on the spigot end, you want to make sure that you're only putting the, the lube on the face of the gasket. If you get any lube back behind the gasket when you're doing the lube, um, then what could happen is that during holding of the pipe, that gasket is going to slip over that step. And, and then it's going to just, it's either going to jam up the pipes and you can't hold it, or it's going to, going to bust the bell. So just make sure that if they're going to put uh, lube on the gasket, and in some cases you don't have to lube the gasket, you can just, just lube the, the bell. Um, just make sure they're careful about that. Uh, the O ring gasket installation is, is definitely the most time and labor intensive. So the groove and the gasket must be lubed thoroughly prior to installation of the pipe. This makes it a, a very messy job. Uh, the gas is then stretched over the spigot, which can be, part, can be challenging without a partner to assist you. And once that's done, you, you equalize it again, run that around a couple of times. Then you have to lube the gasket again. And then you have to, after you lube the gasket again, lube the bell really well. So as you can see, this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about how it's, it's more challenging at the job site. I mean, we're just talking now just about installing the O-ring gasket and getting it ready to install. So it has nothing to do with holding the pipe, but it, this is much more involved and it's much more critical that these steps are all done correctly. So if that's not done, then you're gonna have more issues at the job site. So here's a short video on segment of pipe being installed at a job site and here in my hometown, Lexington, Kentucky. I clipped it a little bit. Um, hopefully I can pause it here, I think I can. Um, so right here, right before the pipe gets close to the other piece, you lift it up really, you lift it up on the back side. So this guy that's over here on this side right here lifts up the back end of it. And this one isn't even as bad as, as most that I see. A lot of times it's it's lifted up like a 45 degree angle. But then what they do is they drop the back end of that piece of pipe down. And as they do so, it's it's possible that the gasket can get dislodged from the spigot end as it runs into the bell of the previously laid piece of pipe. So you know, this may seem like, and this is a common way of installing pipe, but in our opinion, is not the correct one. Ideally, what they're going to do is going to lay the piece of pipe down next to the adjacent one so it's even. Check the gasket, make sure it's it's not dislodged, and then hold it. So I we think that this is a much better way to do it. Um, one question we've received um, much more recently um, over the last couple of years is regarding the maximum joint gap on pipe that's being installed. Um, so your gasket supplier will definitely have recommendations for you on this, but generally we tell customers a typical joint should allow for a half inch gap because that's what the, the testing standards, ASTM C443 and C361, that the deflection testing has a half inch gap. So, so pipe should be okay with a half inch gap, but really this comes down to the type of gasket being used and the joint design. So just make sure that you're working with your gasket, the gasket supplier um, to determine what is, what's ideal for that, for that joint. Like I mentioned on the previous slide, if the gasket becomes dislodged, if they were to, you know, basically pull that pipe incorrectly and it becomes dislodged, um, you know, you're in a situation like you're seeing here where the gasket's hanging down inside of the joint. The other thing that can happen is if the if the pipe is not formed all the way and there's high external water pressure, um, then it also could cause a problem with the gasket slipping outside of that joint. So that's again why installation of the job site is so critical that they're they're doing installing the pipe correctly and completely, uh, closing that gap as much as they can. I know that in this particular case, this is the job that again here in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it was a very expensive project for the producer and the contractor to repair with uh, internal seals. So let's talk about uh, some other job site issues. I mean, if you, if you hear from a contractor with a concern, um, here are some suggestions on handling it. First, I, I, I would ask them to recount exactly what they did. And, and don't coach them. Don't like say, did you do this or did you do that? You ask them, ask them questions that are, you know, just bluntly, how did you do it? And hopefully they're going to give you some honest feedback. I mean, did you, how did you install the gasket? How did you bring the pipe in the trench? And um, how are you bringing the pipe together? Um, 
talk to talk to the guys in the trench. I mean, they're the ones that are going to be the ones doing it. They might give you more information than the supervisor will. Uh, obviously, it's good to observe how crews are doing it, um, but you never know that they might be just putting on a show for you just just because they know you're there. Uh, depending on your relationship with the contractor, uh, you might be able to provide suggestions. Maybe you have a really good relationship, and they'll listen to you and uh, and they'll want to do what's do what's right. Um, others may say, "Hey, I've been doing this for." you know, 30 years and I never had an issue and now I do. Well, that may not be a contractor you can work with very well, but, uh, but try, try the best you can to give them some suggestions on best, better ways to do things. But if a problem does persist, I mean, certainly you can, you can uh, do some testing at your plant. Um, if, uh, but contact your gasket supplier, give them information on the gasket on the project. Uh, maybe they have some suggestions on some other ideas you can do, um, but get them involved um, because I know it's in everybody's best interest to get that resolved as quickly as possible. Uh, some damage can occur at the job site, uh, like the image you can see here on the left. Uh, there's a pretty good crack there, a chunk of concrete broken off could have an impact on the gasket ceiling. Uh, the one on the right is a manhole that um, had a repair done on it and I don't know, to me, it looks kind of like a questionable repair. Uh, it's, it's, it just doesn't look like it's it's flush. Um, so that could also could have an issue, but just um, make sure that any repairs are done, uh, that they're done according to your, your instructions or the pipe plant's instructions. Hey, Alan. Yes. We're, sit, we're sitting at top of the hour. If I don't know how many more slides oh, I, I, you I, get. Yeah, almost done. Okay, rock and roll. Yep. Um, just check to see if there's any damage to, uh, you can see these bells right here. These are, uh, this, this is really bad, probably not going to seal well. So if there's repairs that need to get done, just make sure that those are done correctly. Um, I'm not going to get too much into this, but just make sure that you're following best practices when it comes to storage of your, of your gaskets, um, using first in, first out, um, pay attention to the shelf life of gaskets, keeping them protected from the elements. Uh, you don't want to uh, have them outside in the sun. You don't want to have them outside in the rain. Um, don't, don't mix gas suppliers. I, I say this just because in, in now, nowadays there might be some uh, pipes producers that are using two different suppliers. And if you do that, just make sure you're not mixing them on the same size on the same job. Uh, that way, if there is an issue, you can identify who to deal with uh, once, once, uh, that, once that identification has been done. Again, if you got a place like this to store your gaskets, that's great. If not, don't let it be this way. Uh, if you got to store gaskets outside, um, just make sure you throw a tarp over it to keep it protected from the elements. So you'll probably remember these factors from the beginning of the class. Um, so I've shared about joint designs, uh, dimensional tolerances, and quality assurance. Uh, good tooling will help ensure good joints, and proper quality assurance steps will help um, give your plant more confidence, uh, better job site results, and improve reputation among contractors and municipalities. Uh, you've heard about gasket specifications and selections, so be sure to communicate with your supplier regarding projects requiring special materials or performance. And we talked about installation of the gasket on the spigot, as well as some basics on proper installation. Uh, a relationship with contractors who are more like partners will go a long way towards improved job site installations. So if you follow all these practices, um, as well as good st uh, gasket storage inventory, you should find yourself in a position with fewer issues um, and happier customers and uh, projects that, that uh, will last for generations. So that wraps it up. Sorry about going to, over a few minutes. I didn't realize I was going that slow. But are there any questions that we need to address now or that somebody would like to ask? So Alan, in the uh, chat room, we didn't get any activity. Uh, so nothing there. So it'd either be... Uh, there, is the there is a question on the chat. Yeah, I see there's one here. It looks like it's a, want something about 100-year life. Is that the one? Right. Okay. Um, yeah, th this is a question that we do hear a lot. And, and we've had, uh, you know, I, I don't think there have been any gaskets that have installed for 100 years yet. Uh, certainly there's, there's concrete pipe that has. Um, but we have had um, gaskets that were installed for um, 50 or 60 years. And those projects, they had to, to replace that pipeline and they pulled those, those pipe apart. and um, and looked at the gaskets, and the gaskets were still were doing their job. They were still um, had the properties that they needed in order to still seal those get those joints. So you know, we we feel comfortable saying that the gaskets are going to last for the life of the concrete pipe. So once they're installed correctly, uh, those gaskets are going to to last for 100 years as well. 
Are there any other questions that somebody would like to either voice or? Okay, well, hearing none, I, mean, it's, I certainly appreciate everybody being on the call. Um, you're going to get a PDH, PDH for this. Uh, anybody who wants a PDH, uh, if you have any questions, you can certainly email me or call me. And um, we certainly uh, enjoy talking to you this afternoon. Have a, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday and Happy New Year's. Walt, back to you. Hey, thanks, Alan. Great stuff. Uh, man, I didn't know there was that much information to share about gaskets. So uh, you crushed it. And I know you could have kept going. Uh, uh, thanks so much for being uh, here uh, today to to deliver uh, this topic. I'll, I'll tell you, it's a great way to, to round out the year. We've uh, we've had a great year of training with the Texas Concrete Pipe Association. And uh, Alan, uh, thanks for closing it on with a bang. Seriously, with a bang. It was You're good welcome. stuff. Baseball. Hey, listen, uh, we, we, our next uh, block of training is in the new year in 2023. And it's, uh, we go right back to our fundamentals. We go to pipe installation on uh, January the 17th. Uh, so that'll be from eight to noon central. And then we will also each month have a, an associate like Alan who will give a, a webinar. So we're gonna get back into the business of a half day workshop and a, a webinar each month. And both those events will be free. And we certainly hope you will join us to learn more about what concrete pipe and pre-gas products uh, do for our local agencies and, and uh, our state infrastructure. So I uh, second Alan's comments. I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and y'all be safe. And you'll, also you'll see in the, uh, uh, the chat room, Taryn has dropped the link to uh, uh, where you can see some of the other training opportunities that are gonna be coming up in 2023. Hey, y'all stay safe. Get out of here. Uh, you still need to go to club. Taryn, you want to tell us real quick what we need to do to wrap up? Sorry, we're at 12, five after. Sure. So I'll be brief. A few guys that joined us via Talent LMS will go back to Talent LMS. There'll be a quick eight-question evaluation. So we really appreciate your feedback on that. Afterwards, uh, your certificate of completion will pop up with the PDHs. If you need something different, please feel free to let us know. I think most of you have received an email from me. So if you have any problems, just respond back to that. I know there are a few of you who joined directly through Zoom. If you're worried about PDH certificates, an email, and I will put my email in the chat again as well. Thank you guys for joining us. Thanks, Taryn. All right, y'all stay safe. Get on out of here. Uh, have a great rest of your Monday. Alan, great stuff, man. Cool. If you click on that red lead button in the bottom right-hand corner, y'all can exit the webinar and get over and do the evaluation. Do we have to give them having completed this in order for them to do that eval, Taryn? Yes, and that's taken care of. <laughs> you know, we always forget. We always We do. <laughs> we took a party. Yep. <clears throat> I think we can shut I think we can shut off the yeah, we can shut the recording down that way.